My name is Julian Arado, uh, and I teach at Brooklyn Law School. So the title of my piece is The Private Law Critique of International Investment Law. And what I try to show is that international investment law has been far more distortive of domestic law than is typically appreciated. There's a con conventional wisdom, a growing conventional wisdom, that investment law distorts the state's public regulatory efforts at the domestic level. Uh, and, and there's, of course, some truth to that, but what has gone totally missed is how distortive this regime is for the state's ability to regulate private law, meaning the law of contracts, the law of property, the law of intellectual property, corporate law. And here, I think there's a really sharp problem with how international investment law constrains the state's ability to regulate in the interest of its own citizens uh, in regulating the rules of the game for these very discrete areas of private law. So this sort of new field of the private law theory of investment law opens up all kinds of critiques, from distributional critiques to critiques about efficiency uh, to critiques about fairness. So what I try to do with this article is lay the groundwork for a new research agenda into international investment law from a private perspective, but a critical one. So the bulk of the article is really about critique, criticizing the current jurisprudence and how it interprets investment treaties, specifically in relation to how the treaties apply to different types of commercial assets, where I see the failure to differentiate, creating inefficiencies and unfairness. Uh, but obviously this project speaks to the reform agenda. And interestingly, the reform agenda has been so captured by this powerful and quite important public law criticism, the dominant view, uh, the dominant critical view of investment law, that the reform agenda has been shaped in public law terms. And for me, this is a real missed opportunity because the deeper problems with the regime are coming from how that regime distorts private law. So one of the most important reform movements right now is happening in the halls of UNCITRAL at the United Nations, uh, in the working group three of UNCITRAL. And there, the question of the day is, how should we reform ISDS, investor state dispute settlements, if at all? Is it worth moving to a court model? Is it worth moving to an appellate mechanism or something in between? And I think the private law theory of investment has real purchase on that question. Uh, for example, one of the big questions is, we worry about inconsistent award in investor state arbitration. Now, some inconsistency is just a feature of law. Cases are decided differently. But when we're talking about inconsistencies in whether a state and an investor's contract will be prioritized over a treaty, or whether the treaty will be prioritized over the contract, that has massive implications for parties' ability to plan. How is a state to know, if they're happy with a deal in a contract, whether that deal will be enforced in the end? So these are the real questions that we need to be thinking about as part of this reform process. And this article really just tries to lay the groundwork for all of that. Let me drill down into a, a more concrete example of, of the problem here and just focus on the problem of the relationship between investment treaties and contracts, meaning especially contracts between investors and the host state or state-owned enterprises. So the logic of contract everywhere in the world is a logic of choice. This is different from the logic of property, which is about rigidity. There are a certain number of property forms that the state forces private parties to uh, invest in particular forms, right, with special legal rules. Contract is all about parties choosing what terms are preferable and uh, efficient for them, and we trust parties to make those choices. Investment treaties apply equally. They apply substantive standards and, uh, and procedural rules to both uh, property, to contracts, to IP, to corporate law, but they do so indiscriminately. And the cases have tended to treat contracts as if they were any other form of property on a rigid model uh, with great suspicion to attempts by states and investors to opt out of treaty terms. This is really inefficient and problematic because what it's saying is, look, states and investors, you might know what's best for your relationship, but there's a treaty here and now you can't opt out of it, you have to accept the treaty terms. That creates real costs for bargaining ex ante, and it creates a lot of un unfair surprise costs for states that are unaware that this is what's going to happen um, afterwards. On the substance, what I would say is the key take-home point from the article is that we need to be thinking much more seriously about the different types of assets that investment treaties apply to and take a more differentiated approach to thinking through how these treaties ought to apply to all of these very varied types of commercial legal relationships. And that requires a sophisticated private law frame uh, steeped in the knowledge of corporate law, uh, contract law, property law, not necessarily all at the same time. Uh, but in order to understand what investment treaties do, what they're for, and how they might be reformed, we need to take this kind of pluralistic approach rather than a top-down, 
thinking through of these treaties in one particular way.